Okay, so setting scale in image J. So first off, you, if you if you're looking at an image, you want to have a scale in there. I haven't really said anything important yet, have I? Probably not. Okay, which means I wasted the first 15 minutes of class. Um, just to kind of take you through kind of the the um, the layout of image J. You have all of your headers up here, and the two uh, several of the most important ones, other than file opening things, are going to be the analyze gives you a lot of different analyses that you can do. Process. Process gives you a lot of different ways in which you can manipulate and change images, which is kind of nice. And we will show you some things you need to do with that. And then plugins. Plugins are these, these different kind of smaller programs implemented in ImageJ that people have made for specific purposes. Now, this is one nice thing about Fiji, which is this kind of batteries included implementation of ImageJ is it comes with lots of plugins out of the box, many that you will already need. If you just get the straight image J, it doesn't have any of these. You have to install your own plugins. So that's kind of nice. Okay, so let's go to set scale. Below this, what we have is we have a bunch of different ways of manipulating the image, a lot of little boxes here. So like for instance, we have like the little, zoom in here, whoa, 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 zoom out. A little bit too big. We have the little hand that will allow us to move around the picture. We have like a box selection tool so we can select a box. We have a elliptical selection tool so we can select an ellipse. Actually, here's the funny thing. I can actually see that better up there than I can on my own screen. That's unusual. Uh, we can select polygons. And there we go, we have a polygon. We can uh, freehand select, so here I wanna just do this and I can select that, which is kinda nice. And here's the thing I want at the moment, is the line select. So down here I have my scale. And I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. I'm gonna zoom in and I'm gonna try to get this, say, from one to 11. I'll get that a little bit better. So one thing is that a good strategy for setting scale is you want to set a scale as large in the image as you possibly can. That's because intrinsically, just because of the resolution of the image, but plus also your inability to get this exact, there's going to be some error associated with setting your scale. You want that error to be small in proportion to the actual scale that you're setting. The, the larger that in the image that you make that scale, the smaller the error is going to be between that. So for instance, imagine my, my intrinsic error here between the resolution and just my ability to set it on a perfect pixel is going to be something like, I don't know, a tenth of a millimeter. If I do that over the course of 10 inches here, it's not too bad. If I take a tenth of an inch, however, and I just try to do it between two of these small marks, that error is going to be a lot larger and going to be compounded through each of my subsequent measurements. So making the scale as large in the image as you possibly can and then when you set it using as much as you can is ideal. So you can set the initial kind of image or set the initial extent to this and then the nice thing is we can zoom into it. I lost my thing. Yeah. Set that. I think this is actually a little bit off. So we can go back and we can reset these after the fact. Like this. Move them around. There we go. Come over here. <gasps> Why does that go away? It is. In the middle of class. So we're going to set this again. The middle there if I can. Come in here. That looks pretty good in the middle. Okay, then we're going to come down. And I'm going to come to Analyze, Set Scale. 
And here it already has now the distance in pixels that we expand right there. So that's automatically in there. We need to set the distance in pixels and then the known distance and the aspect ratio. So again, this is another place that we can set that in here. If we do not have a perfect one-to-one -one aspect ratio, we can account for that here. And then the length or the unit of length that we're using. So first off, the known distance I know here is 10 inches. Pixel aspect ratio is one. The unit is inches. I want to set this globally, which means that it's not just for this image. Any image that I subsequently make from this image will also be have those same measurements. It'll have the same ratio of measurements to pixels. And that is important, and then you hit OK. We can actually get actual measurements. So imagine I want to know what is the distance between here to here. This is relatively easy. We just measure that. We just uh, make a line between there, and we hit Control M. Control M takes a measurement of something. And we get that here. So the length of this is 5.555 inches. Uh, some of the other things is it gives you the minimum and the maximum values uh, of intensity between those two points. That's transverse by the line. It gives you the angle that the line is at. It gives you the mean. Uh, so all this refers to the colors that transverses. The area is a little bit weird here because the area is actually taking, if you were to make a perfect box out of these, what would the area be? Wait, is that? I don't know exactly what areas mean for lines. They don't make any sense to me. We can also do something. No, I don't want to save that one measurement. We can come back and we can get areas with boxes. So, or, so for instance, I want to get a circle that encompasses, so I can get like an approximate area of this. So this is a circle that, that encompasses most of that. This is a really bad estimate for area. It's going to be oversized, but we can do that. Another way, other than hitting Control-M, that we can do this, we can go Analyze and then just Measure. And so it's telling us the area of this circle that circumscribes that leaf is 25.146 inches, square inches. OK, cool. And again, it also gives you the range of intensities that we have in there between 5 and 231. Okay, imagine I want to know exactly what the area of this leaf is, however. That seems much more useful than just putting a circle around it. Does anyone know what the very first step I'll have to do in that is, based on our last lecture? Which is a process of, yes, but. <laughs> that falls into what what group of of tasks? Image yes, is segment. So we have to we have to segment the image, and we can do that by binary thresholding. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that actually. So I'm going to talk about some of them. So the simplest way is just to threshold the image. Remember, thresholding the image takes all like looks at the histogram of the pixels. And it says, we draw a line somewhere in there, and above that line, we're going to make all of those white, and below that line, we're going to make all of those black. So let's go ahead and try that out. Let's do some seg uh, threshold segmentation here. To do a normal segmentation, we are going to have to convert this to grayscale, to 256, or to 8-bit uh, grayscale. And there's actually a lot of functions that need to be, the image needs to be 8-bit. So for instance, here we, to change that, we go into image, come up to type, and we have all of these nice, cool things that we can do to it. I'm going to select 8-bit. There's also an 8-bit color, but I just want the normal 8-bit. It converts it to grayscale. The reason for a normal threshold, for a basic threshold, we have to do that is if we're doing this on the color image, we actually have those three different channels that each have their own histogram. We have to threshold based on a single histogram. 
And so the 8-bit image gives us that single, um, um, that single histogram. So we're going to come into, then we come into image, then adjust, and just down to threshold. So let's take a look at this. Um, what you have here is the histogram of colors that are within, that it's making that divider at. And we actually have, in this case, it's a little more fancy than, than just your simple threshold because we have an upper and we have a lower. So actually... Anything between anything between these two bars will become black. Anything outside of them is going to become white. And so it's not just a simple threshold that we have a line above which is white and below which is black, but we have two sliders in which everything, every pixel between those becomes black. Everything outside of those becomes white. So we can go ahead and try to manipulate this. We want that to kind of come through a little bit more. The idea here is that we will get the at least the outline of the leaf being black. Everything else around it being white. Here we go, and that kind of gives it to us. So we hit apply. That, and there we go. We have we have a basically segmented image. There's a couple things we can do to clean this up, but what we have now is white and then black where our leaf is. One more thing that we can kind of do is there's a whole bunch of really cool binary um, of transformations we can make to this. If you go into process and then go into binary, if you come down here, all of these holes we can fill in with this fill holes selection right there, and that will fill in any holes that were inside of here that didn't quite work. Okay. Now there's a couple different ways that we can measure area here. The first one is we can just make a selection of this, and we have this selection wand right here that will select out to, this is what the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth one in, and essentially it's just a straight line with a little kind of like yellow blob at the end and if you click now on this you now see that that yellow line for selection that we make with other things is now selecting around this leaf and we can just hit control M again and measure that so remember when we did the circle encompassing it it was 25 about 25 centimeters squared we should expect something that's lower than that because there's a lot of stuff that wasn't leaf in that circle. And what we got here for area of this leaf is 14.3.31, about centimeter, or excuse me, inches squared for the area of that leaf. This is a lot easier way of measuring the area of a complex object than if you were to try to do something else. Actually, I don't know how else you would do this. Does anyone know how you would do this otherwise? I don't know. Maybe try to make a mold of it and then fill it with some wax and see how much wax that you use. And if you know the depth, then you also know the area. I'm just thinking, how would I do this before computer? I don't even know. But this works pretty well. OK. Now, that works really well there. But imagine I had lots of these. And I, I didn't know what to do. I like, OK, I have a ton of these. How do, I, how do I get all of those in there? Well, first off, let's crop it down to just what we want, the area that we're interested in. And we do that by selecting the area. We go into Image. No, I don't want to rename. And go up to Crop. And now we just have the area of interest. Another nice function that we can use is going to Analyze and Analyze Particles. And this is really nice for selecting multiple areas, lots of different areas, and, and getting some information about all of them. And so we have a, a whole list of things that we can choose here. First off, it gives us a range of sizes that we can select from. So we can cut off things at the small end. We can cut off things at the large end. So we have that from 0 to infinity. 
And this is initially just in inches, uh, in square inches. So this is the area. So what areas are acceptable within our selection? But we can also shift this to pixels. Like if we're not exactly sure, but we have a good idea in pixels what they are, we can click this toggle right here and it'll also be in pixels. We also have this circularity function down here. This is essentially a measure of how circular an object is, how irregular. So one is a perfect circle and zero is like perfectly not a circle. I don't actually know exactly what shape would score zero on this, but if you had a line like a linear something, it would score very close to zero. So we, we can set the range of circularity that we want to select as well, which is kind of useful. And we'll come back to that in a little bit about why that is interesting. And then we can give us some sort of output. What do we want to, uh, it to show us when we're done? And one thing that's really nice is not nothing, but outlines. If we ask it to show us outlines, it will give us an outline, a new window with the outlines of everything that we selected. And then we have all these different other things that we can get uh, that we want it to, we could have it tell us. So for instance, display the results. That kind of seems important. We actually want to know what the results are of the analyzed particles. Clear results doesn't really uh, make sense here. The summarize doesn't really make sense here. So there we go. I just have this one big thing I want to measure the area for in this case. So I'm not going to care really about the size range. I don't care about the circularity. I want it to give me outlines and I want it to tell me the results. So I'm not having to select anything. I hit OK here. And there is the outline of the image that it, it got for me. But here's one thing to kind of notice. You see all these little red things down here? There's all these really little artifacts of little individual pixels that I also selected that I could not see very well right there. If we go look at the other picture here and zoom really in, you see all these? It also selected all of these. And so now I have areas of all these little artifacts around the edge. And those came from, if you, if you saw in the original picture, there is a, uh, there's a shadow there that helped that. If we go to our results then, what that means now is that we have all of these crazy results. The only one that's interesting is the first one, which we selected, and again, we get the area of being 14.308. And again, because it's binary, the min and the max for its intensity is always going to be 255 because, uh, are there any questions on that so far? Okay. Let's talk about a couple different methods of segmenting here. Let me get rid of these. I'm going to open that again. Okay, so if you go into plugins and you go into segmentation, they actually have a lot of different ways that you can segment an image in here. I'm going to talk about a few different ones, but actually, for the moment, none of those plugins for segmenting. I'm going to talk about a couple of ones. Now, what the first thing that we had to do when we did the threshold segmentation is that we had to actually go through and take this and turn this into a 8-bit uh, image. And essentially, when we just convert to an 8-bit image, it takes all three of those color channels for every um, color that we have, it takes the average of those three channels and sets the new pixel uh, intensity to the average of the red, green, blue channel. That might not be the most effective way to actually uh, choose an 8-bit image. We actually have essentially three 8-bit images in here, one for red, one for green, one for blue. And it might be useful to actually separate those out and see what each of those is as its own 8-bit image, and you can do that in here. So, what we can do here is go into image and to color, and this little function right here is called split channels. What this does is it takes just the red channel, just all of the red 8-bit image, and makes it its own 8-bit grayscale image. It does the same thing with blue and the same thing with green. So let's go ahead and click on that. Oh, 
So this is what we have. We have these three images. One of these is blue, one of these is green, one of these is red. But they're all made into their own 8-bit image. And what you'll notice is that in these different channels, this, this leaf shows up differentially good in each of these channels, which is kind of nice. We can choose one now that works the best for segmentation or for threshold segmentation. I would kind of think, actually, this one might look good initially because it's very dark, but the shadow right here is also dark, so that might not work for segmentation. This one is kind of nice and in between that this isn't super dark, but also this is dark. So we can go through and segment each of these by threshold. Let me try this one. Image, adjust, threshold. Actually, that one works pretty well. We zoom in down here. I'm not getting quite the same artifacts I was on the whole image before. So that's another way of approaching a thres threshold segmentation is actually to divide up into its different channels. Each of those is own 8-bit image and then trying to see which one you can threshold the best. Okay, if you have a color image, however, there's also a color threshold that we can do. So let's open up that file again. Open. And then we're going to come into image. Just. And there's this one right below threshold that says color threshold. And this is thresholding on a bunch of other things. Now what we can do is we can use three different things to essentially select what pixels become white and which ones become black. So what we have up here is the hue. So we can select only things in a certain hue. Everything between that becomes a either white or black. We can choose between a certain saturation. So saturation going everywhere from white to very, very colored. And then we can also choose on brightness. So for instance here, we want things that are kind of this orangey color. So I can take the sliders and go, give me just these orangey color things. Which actually is not a good way to do this. But what might be better is the saturation. The paper is very white. This is very saturated. So if we pull out all of the low saturated, get some of that. Another thing might be brightness. It's a lot less bright. Brightness is essentially what we were doing before. And pull down this here. So there we go. So we have that. One nice thing about this is that you can kind of see red over what you're selecting. And then when we want to actually move this to a threshold itself, we can pull down the red and turn this into black and white. There we go. And then hit select. And oops, that's not what I wanted to do. That just selected it. That's not what I wanted to do. I'm going to unselect that. Turn this back into red for a second. See, this needs to expand. That's what it needs to Go back to black and white. There we go. We can just close it. We are in that now. Okay. So we can also threshold based on color. Again, that's going to come up in just a minute. Okay. So that's measuring distance. That's measuring area. Let's talk about how to select and count things. This one? No, let's do the other one. Okay. What we have here is, wow, that looks like just a bunch of white stuff. Never mind. I'll do the other picture. It's a bunch of blood cells up there. And here are the white blood cells. There's like some neutrophils and yeah. Okay. Can you see that one? Kind of. Okay, but you know what it is at least. Okay. 
So once again, we can use uh, several different kinds of segmentation here, but let's segment this again by threshold. You go image, adjust. I'm going to do the color threshold because that works really kind of nicely. Um, Actually, before I do that, okay. So here's one thing that you'll notice, is that something that selects well over here doesn't select as well over here because we have some noise in the background. We also have kind of a gradient in here. So I am going to not do that. Wait. Edit. Undo. Edit. Ah! Thresholds don't like to undo. File. Open. So the first thing that we can do, things that we can do is process and subtract background, and sometimes this can help. I just usually accept the defaults here. Okay, so you see how that evened out the image somewhat. Actually, you can't really tell that much. I can tell better up here. Subtract background helps to even out the image somewhat. And then we can go back into adjust color threshold here and I don't want the bright thing so you see right now the selector is up selecting the bright section we actually want the darker thing so I'm gonna move this down okay so that basically has the cell selected let's go ahead and saturation help me out at all oh the saturation kicks out the white blood cells that's kind of nice stupid white blood cells no one cares about you okay people do okay so we have that I pulled that down tried to get out the red with the white blood cells but I didn't quite get them all okay so now we have all these blood cells that are just kind of like these empty donuts makes sense the inside or the interior of those is thinner than the outside let's go ahead and do a couple things there are a couple things that we notice here first off over here we have all these ones that are this looks so much better segmented up here it looks exactly how it looks on my screen we have all these ones that are overlapping which kind of eh, that doesn't help out so much and then we have these other ones that are are empty in the middle so we can do a couple things first off we can go into process and binary and oh there's so many cool things in binary again fill the holes oh there's an 8 bit actually I'm going to do this another thing is for a lot of these to work in the binary you actually have to convert this to a mask um, so convert to mask that tends to work better and then image binary or process binary. Now let's fill those holes. Okay, so now we filled in all the holes here of all these nice little red blood cells. We have them all over. We grabbed a couple, like there is a white blood cell that's left out here, that's good, and a couple other ones. And a few places where a few were left out. So. But we have a lot of them up here that are overlapping, and that's not gonna work very well. So there's kind of this other nice function for binary that we can go and we can go process, binary and then watershed what that does is it essentially tries to figure out where it thinks there are two things and puts a one pixel division between those two things and it's using this algorithm where essentially if this was if this was a topology based on distance from the edge where would you have separate peaks and where would you have divisions between those peaks it's kind of cool. I enjoy it. But now, with a lot of these, we have them where we had three, we had them separated out now. We have these separate, we have these separate. A lot of these ones that were overlapped are now separated. Now what we can do is go back in and go to analyze and analyze particles. And now we do not want the infinity. So what we want to do, oh, we're still set to inches here. Never mind the area. We don't care about the area of these. If we cared about the area of them, we could do that as well. 
But I'm going to set this down to pixel units. And we have a lot of little platelets in here. And I actually don't want to pick up, look, imagine I don't want to pick up all the platelets. You have a platelet here, 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 um, here, like, they're over the place. And no one really cares about them. At least I don't at this moment. So I'm going to set this up to, like, nothing more than, like, 20 pixels in area do I want you to count. The circularity, I want it to be fairly circular. So I'm going to set this up to a 0.5 in circularity. I think things should be pretty circular. And then this time I don't want to display the results because I don't want to know the areas of everything. All I want to know is how many there are. So I'm going to give it instead of display results. I want to give me summarize. This is going to give me the counts of everything that it actually found. And I hit OK. And there we go. This is the outlines of everything that it counted. One thing that you'll notice is I still got some of the platelets. If I was really intense on doing this, I would hike it up a little bit to uncount the platelets. But also gave me the summary, how many blood cells did it count in here? And we had eight, wow, right on 800. That's really interesting. That takes a lot less time than actually sitting and counting 800 cells. Significantly. Cool. Let me give you one other example of this and something that is a little bit more ecological. So, this is, yes? How do you get to not count So, the way that I did that is I used that in my segmentation. I used the saturation threshold. If we go back to the original one, let me open up the original file again. Um, you notice that these more saturated than everything else. So I cut out the high saturations and it dropped out the nuclei of them, which left them into amorphous kind of blobby things. And then when I hit the circularity up, it's going to drop off all the amorphous blobby things. Does that kind of make sense? So yeah, you just kind of have to adopt a strategy that gets what you want and not the other things that you don't want. And if I, if I was more aggressive with the, um, with the saturation, you'll notice that the platelets are also more saturated than the red blood cells, so I could probably drop those out a little bit better as well if I had been a little bit more aggressive with the saturation. So, yeah. So that's red blood cells. Let's count something else. Just real fast as uh, another example, or get that and the density of something. Um, I'll go through this one quick. This is my backyard yesterday. It has a lot of dandelions in it. Imagine I wanted to count the number of dandelions I have uh, grown in my backyard. Which there are a significant number of them. Uh, and I actually want to know the density. Imagine I want to know the density. How many dandelions blooms do I have per square foot in my backyard? I can do that. You'll notice here that I put in a measuring tape. I have a nice little... I can actually measure things. So I'm actually going to just very roughly mark off like one foot here. Um, no, don't. Okay, so from here... I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting it really accurate, but that's one foot. I'm going to go back into Analyze, set scale. Now I have this scale. This is known distance is one, and it's one foot. I should say feet, because it'll be square foot. Square feet. Yeah, that makes more sense. OK. Now I want to use the color threshold, because that's a really useful tool, to pick out all of my uh, dandelions. Here's the thing, I actually don't want to get my measuring tape in there. My measuring tape happens to be kind of the same color as my dandelions, and I don't want the bloomed one. So I'm going to go into image, adjust, color threshold. And I want this, for the moment, I'm going to put this to red. Now, the nice thing about red, then, is it'll cover up the things I'm selecting, which you can kind of see, then, am I getting what I want or not. Let's see here. Right now, I'm getting everything that's, like, everything. I don't want that. I want the yellow things. So let's come in here to the yellow things. I 
And I want things that are pretty saturated. So let's bump up the saturation. Now here's one cool thing in this image. I'm doing a pretty good job there at the moment. Um, this is more yellow and these guys are a little bit more red. So I've actually drug it down and you notice that the upper yellow here is not being selected, but like the more reddish yellow is being selected. So I can actually drop out my measuring tape here. Ooh. And then maybe brightness, toggle around with that. But actually, yeah, let's back up. If you look now, so this is kind of nice. The red is now covering the dandelions. This is what I'm selecting. And it's not covering things that are not dandelions. Okay, hey, I've, I've selected the dandelions pretty well. If I was really picky about this, I could spend some more time with it. I'm going to now convert this to black and white. I'm going to convert this to black and white. Thank you. There we go. And then I'm also going to take it and then I'm going to uh, convert this to mask. Binary mask. That's going to allow us to use the binary functions a little bit more. And then the next thing we're going to do, okay, so I do have some noise in here, like these little tiny spots and some spots along here. So I don't want to get anything that's super small. So let's go back into Analyze. I'm going to go to Analyze Particles again. And again in pixels, but here I'm going to set this down. I'm going to say like anything that's less than, let's say 10 square pixels I don't want to count. I think anything like super small like that is going to be not what I want. Again, I would kind of jigger with this a little while if I wanted to get something really good. And here I'm going to say display results because I want to know what my, well, I'm going to, I'm going to show you. Click OK. And here it goes. There are the dandelions that selected. Actually, I'm actually going to set the, I'm going to try this again. I have my circularity set really high. And some of these things are not very circular. And actually, I think I want to break up clumps here as well. Let's try this one more time. No, I don't want to save those. I'm going to go process, binary. I want to um, watershed separation between yep so we got some separation like here a little bit of separation up here okay and then the next thing is to then process now analyze analyze particles now I'm gonna set my circularity because sometimes these are like lying on their side it has something weird so I'm actually gonna set this way down set back down to zero still keep up my my 10 memo maybe i'll even kick that up a little bit to 15 because i was still getting a little bit of the outline of the uh, measuring tape here on this again okay there i got dandelions and if i look at the summary now again it'll give me the number 627 dandelions that's a lot and that actually gives me the the area of the photograph and if I just go into measure back into here analyze measure without selecting anything it will give me the entire area of the whole picture itself which is down here so the entire picture is 133 square feet in those 133 square feet I have about 600 some odd um, things so it's turning out I have like what four dandelions per square foot in my backyard anyways so there you go okay with that we're gonna work on this more in in lab you'll get some opportunity to do this yourself but with that go ahead and leave my presence get out of here yes Yes, you can. And actually, there's some other segmentations that you can you can set the segmentation, save the profile, and then just run it batch as well. So yeah, and that's in some of the, the specific uh, segmentation plugins. There will be an assessment over this up sometime this morning. I have one last question to put on there, and then I'll have a, a applied and a theoretical for the past two days. Okay.
Let me see here. I actually want to know what that density is now. How's it going, Elliot? Oh, going well. I was going to mention, you could, yeah. um, have you ever heard of Rent-A-Goat? I hear that might be helpful for the game of lion. <laughs> they add color to my yard. I don't care. <laughs> I know Kalu was like, you have to kill your whole yard. I was like, why? It's like, what, what are they doing? They're fine. They're infecting They're, they're the sequestering, yard. they're sequestering carbon is what they're doing. They're helping with ocean acidification is what they're doing. <laughs> Copy. Which yeah. gives you yeah. PhD, another PhD. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'll switch to your office. Okay, I'll be down there in just a second. I need. I want to do the actual calculation now, of how many. How many did you like? Yeah, that's 627 and 133 square feet. 4.7. So it's actually a little bit low. I have 4.7 dandelion blooms per square foot. Your yard is way nicer than mine. <laughs> only is because you're looking at top down. You can't see the height of the grass. See, but you, for me, it's like a grass. Really, it is just a dandelion, and I'm kind of fine with that because it's green stuff. So yeah. 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 Mine, mine are less so because I have a dog that poops back there, which helps the dandelions grow, but makes their leaves a little bit less palatable, probably. Ah, yes. Um, so I pasted in the stuff you sent me mm -hmm. for outputting this. Uh -huh. as, this is the G code. Um, outputting this as actual G code. Uh -huh. And it, uh, this is what he looked like. Um, so I obviously got something slightly wrong. Okay, um, let's see here. What, what's the vector you're trying to do this to? Uh, so I have this uh, x. Well, y. It's, okay. That actually might be a problem here. Yeah. All the variables are stored in the board. Yeah, you need to tell it where to go. So, like, I, I had x. I had. Yeah, so I had x, y, and z. So, you, like, here? Mm -hmm. This, this x here, this y, this z, and these x's need to be replaced with where those are stored in your data. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, maybe I could even make a function for that at some point. Writing functions in R is like better than not writing functions. Functions are the way to go. Yeah. Um, so this is this is one of the major points that I have. Okay. But it, uh, does it actually make sense to make, like, turn this into a matrix if I have it in a sensible vector? Um, this, this works fine. Like, like okay. what you have is fine. Okay. The only thing you do is go to the top of this. Yeah. So I need, I guess, well, labels. Yeah, the over maybe, maybe just is actually give the me second layer of the matrix. That's what you need to change. It just it's calling something that doesn't exist, and so yeah. when it when it does it, it's like whatever. Well, I closed this and it's still going up there. Thanks, Kurt. No problem.